Hello everyone, welcome to SOCH 108A, uh, Traditions in Research Methods. My name is Eric Nielsen, I'll be your professor. This is my one-eyed cat Willow, she'll be my uh, occasional teaching assistant. Maybe Terror of the Midnight Sun would be more accurate. Anyway, I let her go do her, her job so I can get back to mine. Um, so as you know, we are going to be meeting over the next couple of weeks uh, online. We'll kind of explain that, go over that in a moment, go over the course and basically what's what's expected of you. So the first thing you'll want to do is go to Gaucho Space and right in the first block, you'll see the syllabus. You'll bring that up and I've already got that ready to read here almost. So, um, <clears throat> should point out there are two actual teaching human teaching assistants uh, in the class re brendan as well as nurgle isaac uh, you can find their email addresses here and also their sections and so you are being divided up into sections some of you uh, will have sections on tuesdays others will on thursdays um, and there are a couple of different sections uh, each day Normally, if things go go back to normal and we go on campus, uh, we will meet in Phelps 1160. Um, but be prepared to switch back to online, either asynchronous, Zoom. We'll kind of just see how uh, these things go. Right now, tentative, tentatively, my own office hard hours are Thursday at 2 p.m. That may change. Um, just kind of juggling a few things here and there. So I'll let you know if there is uh, some substantial changes there. Okay, so in this class, we're going to be looking at a whole range of ways in which to investigate the world sociologically and look at some of the methods that are used. And I think we'll, you know, we'll end the course with a much better understanding of how to uh, <laughs> of how to understand the world, if that if that makes sense. Um, I'm just going to briefly go over a couple things, let you go over the most of the syllabus. I do want to stress this little paragraph here at the bottom. So again, as you know, first two weeks, we're going to be online on Wednesday, March 12th. I'm sorry, March 12th. That's, that's certainly not what I wanted to say. Uh, January 12th, we will have a Zoom session. Um, so that way I can answer any questions you may, might have, um, directly and so on. Now, if we return to the classroom in two weeks as currently proposed, that will be on January 19th. So it'll be Wednesday, January 19th. Uh, MLK Junior Day is the 17th. So that would be the first time we meet. And I do want to point out that in this class, we are only going to be physically meeting for the lectures uh, on Wednesdays. And then we will, um, you'll be watching the, the lectures on Monday. I'll be uploading um, a, a video lecture that will run about an hour, hour or so. Um, <clears throat> So that will continue. So basically, you know, we're only going to be meeting in the lecture hall in Phelps on uh, on Wednesdays. And then you'll meet with the TAs in the rooms as proposed or Zoom if, you know, COVID or something else happens. Um, anyway, just, just be prepared for changes if anything uh, needs to change, as we've all <laughs> gotten used to over the last over the last year. Other things that I wanted to go over, there is a textbook, uh, Understanding the Social World. It's, I want you to get the brand new edition, the 2021 uh, edition. I think they are either at the library, uh, not the library, I'm sorry, the, uh, the bookstore or are going to be there soon, or you should be able to get, get um, ebook access, which might be actually the most reliable I'm right now. I just threw this in here for those of you who are interested about video and social science research. I, this is something that's, you know, come about really in the last 10, 15 years, and especially as everyone has, you know, essentially a, a video recording machine in their pocket at all times. Um, we're seeing a lot, an explosion of sort of social research being done uh, on video and little documentaries being made. I advised an astrophysics major uh, who was doing a, a 
documentary, a little video uh, research project on political extremism. It didn't have anything to do with astrophysics. I just like to say that I advised an astrophysics major in something. So anyway, um, if you're interested, that's I, I think that's kind of where the future is probably going, in, at least in some ways. Now, as you're all probably dying to know what are you going to be evaluated on in this class, there aren't going to be any quizzes or tests uh, or anything like that. We basically it'll be a participation, discussion, and this construction of a research proposal that you'll be working on. And you'll be using this software called Packback. Um, which I'll go explain more of in a moment. You do have, it's sort of, it's on an external site uh, from Gaucho Space. It does cost, I think, $30. So I know education is, is expensive already. I started using it in my larger classes at Penn State University uh, before the pandemic, just <laughs> right before it turned out. And then after the pandemic happened, it proved to be a pretty invaluable resource. And even though Gaucho Space and in Penn State's case Canvas um, have have their own discussion formats, as you'll see, there's, um, I think, this is superior in many ways, and it really does foster a lot more engagement, I've found. As I said, we'll explain, I'll explain that in a moment. You can look into it on your own. Um, so what you'll be doing with it, a total of seven weeks throughout the semester, you will post a question and then respond to two of your peers' uh, questions. So a total of seven questions and 14 responses and you get to choose which of the seven weeks you post during. Um, so it's not, you know, you aren't required to post this week or next week, but um, that is cutting that, cutting into the, the, the number of weeks that are left. So just keep that in mind. Again, I think once you get on there and you play around with it a little bit, uh, you'll see that it's, that it's fun. Um, late policy, I'll let you look at that on your own, the citation format. Um, support and resources, all these things. If you uh, are with DSP and need need accommodations, just let me know. As I said, we, we don't have exams, um, but if you need accommodations in any other way, again, just, and just let me know. Uh, we're all supposed to be vaccinated and wearing masks. That's will be the one thing that I am able to uh, enforce regarding COVID. So make sure to wear your mask uh, if we do come back, especially with Omicron, even though cloth masks and many things don't seem to work. It's it's one of our few barriers of protect protection. Um, let me see. So other things. Just the, you see the, the syllabus here and you kind of see where each week we cover a different topic, a different chapter in the book. The first time you have some, something due will be, uh, the, the research topic and we'll go into this in more detail. Those things will be located uh, on Gaucho space, which I shall bring up now. Okay. So Gaucho space, this is where, um, I've just got a short little 10 minute video, just kind of, you know, one of these 10 minute crash course videos looking at research methods. I've got the slides to the lecture I'm going to give today. And you can see each, each week the same thing will happen. I'll, there, there might be some video that I'll post. Um, the lecture slides will be posted. Anything like that, anything, you know, that's additional to the class. I will also be opening up drop boxes for, uh, for your papers and so. I think that's about it in terms of what I wanted to go over regarding what's on the website and the syllabus and get into uh, the lecture right away then. Talk about myself a bit too. <clears throat> so this is the scientific method and essentially what we're talking about is um, kind of that light I realize it just blaring inward, sorry. <laughs> um, wish I had a lights person to, to do something. I'll, I'll do it myself. Okay. All right, I'm back. So um, <clears throat> this is the basic scientific method that's applied in sociology uh, to answer certain questions. 
Um, as I said, uh, this is the textbook you'll be using, and make sure uh, that you get in understanding the social world, second edition. Russell uh, Shutt also uh, writes a book called Exploring the Social World, and I think that one's in like its ninth edition. So make sure you get this one and not the exploring one. Um, I think this one is, is it's a bit more stylish and so on. Uh, again, you know, we'll just be prepared to be meeting on Wednesdays when we do start meeting uh, again. Otherwise, we'll be relying on Zoom and, and, and that. So um, we'll just see what happens. See what this little pathogen decides to do. Okay, so uh, pack back. Find where to put myself. Okay, so <clears throat> what you'll be doing, um, you'll be given the opportunity to make an avatar of yourself. Uh, so there's me with the same haircut I've had for like a decade or something. Um, I'm the teacher, so I get an apple. You do not. Um, what you're going, going to be doing is asking a question. And this is kind of what it looks like. The course is being set up through Packback right now and over the next couple of days that will come online but this is essentially what the post will look like you'll ask a question how do you think sociological research methods can help us understand a social issue that in interests you and then you have to give an explanation of kind of like okay why is this question important um kind of elaborate you know you know why is it you think it should be answered uh maybe what you think the answer is and then you're also allowed to to, to cite a source. So I've just got it linked to the, the book's website. And that's fine. That's all you kind of need to do. And you'll be responding to two of your peers um, each week in addition to writing a question. Now, one thing you do want to pay attention to is this number here. This is called a curiosity score, and you want to keep it above 60. Um, the nice thing about about packback is you can go in and edit it. No one else sees your curiosity scores except you and uh, the professor and the TAs. Um, so when I first actually wrote this question, I my curiosity score is the 54, um, and I'm you know telling you to do above 60. So I had to go in there and uh, you know make sure that my questions were worded better, that this paragraph you know was was more concise. Um, so you can do things like that that will raise the curiosity score. Now there's no, you don't necessarily need to have it in the 90s or 100 or something like that, but it will reflect well on you. And your TA and professor your, may, may remember these interesting questions that you brought up and write you a good letter of recommendation or uh, something like that someday. <coughs> so anyway, I'll kind of show that again um, once it's up and running. So a little bit about me, um, not too much though. I think the in terms of what's important for this class, uh, well, I'm I'm originally from Nebraska. I got my master's in sociology at the University of Kansas. I did research on uh, comparative historical research on the conflict in Darfur in Sudan that was happening about 20 years ago. I uh, did my master's thesis on that. I came to the University of California, Santa Barbara, to uh, to continue doing that research, and for a variety of reasons, changed directions and started looking at um, urban development, sustainable urban development on the West Coast, and it was a, was a pretty big change, obviously. Um, my research was published as a book a few years ago, Smart Growth Entrepreneurs, Partners in Urban Sustainability. It's a fantastic book. It makes a wonderful um, nighttime reading, morning reading, a wonderful gift for family and friends, uh, and so on. So go out and buy it. Um, no, it's actually, well, you can buy it if you want. It's, it, it's priced a bit too high. It's mainly priced for institutions such as, you know, university libraries and so on. But I combined a bunch of different approaches, a bit of quantitative analysis with some QCA, which is qualitative comparative analysis. We'll talk about that later. Uh, historical comparative analysis, observations, uh, and interviews. And I was looking at a bunch of no a number of different cities in um, 
the Santa Barbara region, going up to San Luis Obispo, down to I believe Thousand Oaks, uh, and then the suburbs of Portland, Oregon, and kind of looking at the housing in these different places. You know how how these uh, cities were meeting their housing need, but also doing so in a way that was not uh, having as much impact on on uh, you know negative impact on the environment as 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 more recent urban development has. And so my primary source of interview ended up being the people I interviewed. Um, my primary source of data ended up being the, the, the uh, people that I interviewed. And these were city planners, uh, developers, architects, housing activists, a range of different people, different social actors, stakeholders, um, and tried to find out how these projects, these urban developments came to be or how they did not work out. And, you know, what I found was actually quite interesting. There's my initial research question, um, you know, which was kind of acting, asking how these different institutional actors work together. Um, but the interesting finding was that a lot of the developments I was looking at weren't doing so well financially. A lot of them had restaurants or commercial spaces on the ground floor and then residential spaces above, which is, you know, typical in older towns, older cities, downtowns, and is a way in which to increase housing density without uh, building ever outward and running out of land and water and so on. Um, the problem, though, that I found was that the commercial spaces really struggled. Um, in some cases, they had been vacant for a long time. And now they're, you know, now they're being hit with, you know, more competition from Amazon and COVID uh, and so on. And I may do, you know, kind of revisit some of these uh, developments that I looked at and say, OK, how, how are things looking now? We'll see. We'll see if I go in that direction. So anyway, um, more I'll kind of talk about my own research here and there as it may may apply. So all of this then is trying to bring the methods of science, you know, the the reasoning of science into into the study of society. <clears throat> Try to develop systematic ways in which to look at look at topics. Also, how to look at topics perhaps differently than other researchers. Science, the main thing to know about science is that research is basically continually developing. We're always learning more, um, as, as you'll see, as we'll see as I give, you know, examples of different uh, research methods. Now, why is this important if, say, you're not, you know, you, you're not planning on being a sociologist, you're, you know, you're majoring in SOCH, but, you know, you don't plan on becoming, you know, a social scientist or something like this. Well, there are a lot of ways in which, whoops, ways in which um, research methods can be helpful. There are many jobs in which you may have to test a hypothesis and you may have to think about different theories, especially if you're going into, say, um, government or perhaps uh, co corporate research or other sorts of institutional research. All of this is going to be, you know, absolutely crucial to understand. And I would say that there are a lot of opportunities and there are going to be opportunities in this area. Um, I spent a year as a social work advisor, as a campus social work advisor for, <clears throat> excuse me, Sonoma State University. And I sort of learned during that time period that, you know, social work is projected to be one of the fastest growing occupations over the next 10 to 20 years as the population ages. And now with, um, with COVID, we see a huge, huge need for people going into the mental health field. And, you know, for those of you who are kind of, you know, worried about what you might be doing or what opportunities uh, may be available uh, in a few years, you know, what the next few years may, may even look like, mental health. There's there's a huge need for, for mental health people, especially in schools, especially um, school counselors, all that stuff. The COVID really really expose some of the problems there. Not only were there already a huge shortage, but we have a huge, huge mental health crisis that's just beginning to emerge now, um, as we see in uh, more violence in schools since they've been on, they've come uh, back in person, 
more depression, more suicide attempts, all of these negative in indicators. So anyway, if there's opportunities here um, and there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Okay, now going back to sociology. <clears throat> so sociology as a discipline kind of began with the big three, Marx, Max Weber, Emile Durkheim, uh, who you all should know about. And if you don't, you could be pilloried in some departments. Um, anyway, they were interested in studying large scale systems, macro sociology. So studying things like capitalism, um, the, the, the transition from rural to urban societies, uh, the transition from non-industrial to industrial societies, government, religion, you know, these huge, huge, uh, systems that the cross, uh, cultures and civilizations. Um, and it was really a number of American sociologists that developed a more fine-tuned uh, empirical approach. One of them being W.E.B. -E du Bois, and it's not pronounced in the French Du Bois, uh, it's pronounced Du Bois, and he did that sort of um, consciously. And he wrote, he's famous for the book Souls of Black Folk, and this uh, theory, this, this idea of called uh, of double consciousness, this idea that if you're a minority in, in a society, not only are you conscious of the norms and values and everything of the majority culture, but also the minority culture, which has to be somewhat different in order for it to be uh, considered a minority. And uh, so he developed this concept of double consciousness, which then has been you know, built upon in many different ways. And just a few years ago, they published his, uh, this, this book of his, these graphs and charts that he made. So, you know, back in the late 1800s, he was really doing, and early, I should say, early 1900s more, he was really doing some fascinating stuff looking at looking at data and figuring out ways in which to visualize it you know now you see a lot of um job job opportunities where the title is you know data visualizer that's essentially what uh du, du bois was doing and he was trying to you know make make the data um you know, stick out more, make it more perceptible rather than just say some uh, regression coefficients or uh, some numbers, some counts and so on. So here you've got um, the percentage of the pop of the black population that were slaves. And so he's kind of kind of emphasizing that throughout most of of American history during this time, the vast majority of black people were slaves. You had, you know, a very small amount that got to a high of 14% in 1830. Um, and then by the time the, you know, the Civil War um, had begun, 11% um, of, the, of the black population was free. And then here in 1865, 66, by 1870, roughly, you know, you've got 100% of the population that's, uh, that's free. Well, you know, there's still some research that that you know, not exactly everyone was, was free, but you know, in terms of large scale populations, uh, essentially around 1875 or so, uh, the the entire black population is is more or less freed. Other another early sociologist who's finally starting to get get more recognition, uh, Harriet Martineau. She essentially is known for bringing sociology to England from France, where she had been uh, studying it. And kind of like Durkheim, I mean, kind of, not Durkheim, I'm sorry, kind of like uh, Du Bois, she was interested less in these large systems of, you know, of society like religion and uh, economics and so on, and was more interested in people's daily life. And she quickly realized that there uh, needed mu to be much more research on uh, domestic life, on family life, on marriage, on children, on poverty, and how people in poverty, you know, how people in poverty uh, handled it. And so she became famous for doing doing some of this and, you know, looking at um, women and other aspects of society. And her, her work was actually quite, oops, quite 
um, quite broad. So she has kind of a, her general kind of study survey of what America looked like at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. She also has this writings on slavery and the American Civil War. Um, so she was writing quite broadly and was very interested in what was happening in this new society in the United States. <coughs> So American sociologists took off under the University of Chicago. This was one of the first research institutions in the U.S. You may, you're at UCSB, but you, which is an R1 university, but you may not know what, what that is. Probably wouldn't have any reason to know unless you were a grad student or something like that. R1 means basically top-notch research university. Doesn't get a whole lot better, you know. University of Chicago is an R1. Um, Penn State University is R1, where I teach a couple classes. UCSB is R1, and so on. Uh, so the University of Chicago, they start the first sociology department in the United States. And they went more the route of Harriet Martineau and W.E.B. Du Bois, as opposed to Marx, Weber, and Durkheim. They basically kind of um, championed three different approaches, methodological approaches. One, which was a case study. Um, one is historical method, and that using everything from government data to the collection of autobiographies, diaries, um, you know, the collection of letters, archiving, uh, that kind of thing. And they were also the ones to really bring the statistical method into sociology and re recognize you can find out a lot by uh, running some, running some statistical uh, studies. Robert Ezra Park, one of the major figures, founders of uh, the University of Chicago sociology program. Also Ernest Burgess, another one. He liked maps a lot. His students were always making maps. Um, and what they did was it really shaped the way in which a lot of American universities and now the world have been uh, developed by promoting research as well as just the dissemination of knowledge. And they used Chicago as essentially their laboratory. And, you know, they would run, uh, study different neighborhoods and uh, look at crime, and suicide rates. And, you know, because of the University of Chicago, um, their sociology history, Chicago is actually one of the most, uh, ha has been one of the most studied history uh, cities in all of uh, human history, which is pretty interesting. And, you know, they would be making maps and trying to figure out, okay, where are people living? You've got Deutschland, which is like where the Germans are, where uh, the uh, Sicily then the Italians are. Um, then you've got the single family homes on the edges of these new things called the suburbs that were uh, being developed and so on. And um, so they really, as I said, uh, really opened the doors to a lot of different uh, different research. Another figure, the first African-American president of the American Sociological Association, um, Franklin Frazier. He, uh, he wrote, did a lot of research on African-Americans during slavery, as well as uh, the family after slavery. And this, I had to just post this. This is from basically that time period around the 19... 40s, 1950s or so, you know, recognized authority on Negro family. Uh, his writings have created a deeper understanding of of Negroes, both in this country and in South America. Um, and, you know, kind of starts off by talking about how he began his uh, career as a teacher of math, history, and English. Um, anyway, uh, so they're recognizing, recognizing, you know, the role that the sort of unique role that he's that he's played in in history, so he kind of emphasizes this this approach that's similar to Martineau and Du Bois um, and and Park and Burgess of more empirical focus, and so as opposed to the broad theory of Marx, Weber, and Durkheim, we're trying to get into um, you know what the actual data says. It says nothing. It turns out. 
Uh, no. The one thing I'm just going to run through some of the things that we're going to talk about in this class. And so this is just very, very broad. We're going to be returning to all of this. You know, don't feel like you have to write this stuff down. Um, this is just a rather broad kind of overview of some of the things we'll be discussing uh, in this class. One thing to know is things are easy or seem easy to understand after they happen. So sometimes you think, oh, if I, you know, would have known this or that, I would have been able to predict anything. You know, it's as humans, we're not very good at figuring out probabilities. Some of us may be and, you know, may be better than others. But naturally, our brains are not really set up to work out probability problems. And, you know, you have to, you have to work out, work out, work on some probability problems before you can really understand, uh, how they work and get good at them. But that's what, you know, a lot of research and especially statistical research is really all about. At the end of the day, it's all about, uh, probabilities of this event happening or that and that having an effect on this variable or not. And that's really what's going on here. But we all are sort of guilty of hindsight bias, like, oh, right, you know, for example, say, this is more political science, but the election of Donald Trump in 2016. Um, I thought he was going to get elected partway through 2015, or I'm sorry, partway through, yeah, well, I guess it was December 2015 is roughly when I thought, yeah, there's a good chance actually Trump's going to to win. Um, but there were a lot of people who didn't see it coming, but then after he won and they had sort of, you know, kind of dealt with it, uh, then all of a sudden they have these reasons, well, here's why he won and here's why, uh, you know, and if I would have just known that, then I would have been able to predict this. Again, just, just be wary of that. So one of the kind of most basic ways of uh, doing sociolo sociological research that many of you have probably sort of engaged in without actually maybe, you know, taking notes is observational research, just observing participants in social situations. Um, this actually can yield a lot of very interesting data. And as I said, increasingly now we're using videos, so it's not just, you know, what the researcher can record or what they can remember, but we can actually count, capture it on on video. What's important here is that you can actually see the sites out in the real world. <clears throat> Although I say this with a picture of uh, clearly a social psychologist or someone doing developmental psychology work, uh, looking at how these kids are interacting and so on. In my observational research, it consists of going to a lot of these uh, urban developments, these building projects, visiting them, walking around, taking pictures of them, um, going into the stores that were located on the ground floor, and so on. So there's observational research. If you're majoring in sociology, you'll probably, you're probably good at making some sociological uh, observations. Now, you know, fine-tuning that into a research method is, you know, where is the, sort of the, the next step. Other thing that is really required of all before you do any research is kind of archival research. Um, well, I should back up and say, you know, if we include literature reviews and stuff, um, actual archival research would be uh, direct sources such as newspapers, different government agency reports, company reports, hospital records, that kind of thing. So you may be collecting and, and working with that type of data. Another one of the more popular, most popular used methods in social science tends to be the survey. And I'm sure you've all taken surveys before. Uh, surveys, there's pros and cons. The pros are that you get, a, you know, if you're the one who develops the survey, uh, you can send it out and maybe you're the one who, who wrote the questions. Uh, or you chose what questions at least would be there. Um, you can have some control over the sampling. There, there are problems, though. A lot of people don't fill out surveys, uh, so that's a big one. Um, sometimes they don't complete the surveys. Sometimes a sample might be problematic, might be biased. But if you do get a good survey um, and you do don't have any problems in terms of the, the the sampling then surveys can actually yield some fantastically interesting information and we'll uh, give examples of that 
Surveys often can show what we call correlations. That means that we can see that one relation, that one variable causes another, or I'm sorry, one variable seems to move, <laughs> move along with another variable. I almost said causes another uh, variable to move, and that was that would have been totally wrong, and I would have been uh, forever, I would have forever banished myself from the classroom because. One of the things we have to talk about when we talk, talk about correlation is the fact that correlation is not causation. Um, for example, you may have, you may have gun laws in a, in a certain state that are fairly strict, but you may have a lot of gun violence happening in a, uh, in, in one of the cities. Illinois, for example, you have, you have, uh, you have tighter gun restrictions than, uh, some of the neighboring states. Yet we see Chicago as some of the worst gun violence in any American city. And so someone could say, well, maybe Illinois' gun laws don't work. But then you might look at, well, it turns out that, that uh, there's other cities in Illinois that haven't experienced the same uh, spike in gun violence. And so then it may be something about just Chicago that you're looking at. So again, we have to be careful about correlations about seeing uh, you know gun laws and gun violence seeing, seeing a clear correlation between those two um, or clear uh, causal relationship do the gun laws cause uh, more or less gun violence so that's something something in which more research actually needs to be done on surprisingly there's not not a lot of research on that at least not enough. Now, experimental research, not done by sociologists as much as some of these other methods. Nevertheless, most research is based on experimental design. And if you can actually do some good experimental research, you know, great so sociologists or a great research will combine experimental research with some uh, interviews along with some other, you know, surveys or something like this. <coughs> What's great about the experiment is that you have total control over it. You get to essentially assign people to different connect to conditions. Um, and what you're doing basically is seeing whether there's a change in this outcome uh, if from the independent variable. So the independent variable is the variable that's being manipulated or that you're hypothesizing has some outcome, has some impact on the dependent variable, whatever the outcome of that might be. So the de de dependent variable then is, you know, is what you're essentially measuring to see if there's been a change here. So it could be something like, you know, just easily um, income education income and education, the years of education have an effect on income. And yes, it does. Overall, it, you know, more years of education generally means higher income. Not all the time, uh, but, but often. Um, and we'll talk about this in much, much greater detail, but that's basically the, the, the you know, the, at, at the core of a lot of research is the, the analysis of, the impact of the independent variable or variables on whatever the, the dependent variable is. Now, how, so you got that and you, you know, want to do your research, then you need to find out how to figure out what your sample is and how to assign people to these different conditions. If you're doing experimental design, um, you'll have the treatment condition and a control condition. So um, maybe you're interested in, you know, how well people do later on in life, going back to education and income. The people in the treatment uh, condition are those who maybe they are already enrolled in some after school program and they have wealthier parents or something like this. Uh, the control students are those maybe they're not in an after school program, you might find that the key thing here might be income. Uh, so that's where you would where you would see the causality come out more. But even then, before you get to that point, you still got to figure out what the damn sample is going to be. So th the fact of the matter is, where we can't, we almost never can get data on everyone in a population. 
So, for example, you know, if you're doing a study on you know, college students or something like this, um, you that's you're not going to be able to study every single college student. So you'll need to develop a sample, and there are different ways in which you can do it. There are basically essentially two. One is to have random sample, and the other is to have a convenient sample. I taught a qualitative research methods class in environmental studies last quarter and most of them were interviewing people all of it was convenient samples these are basically you come up with your sample based upon you know people that are you can easily survey or easily interview which is great because it's <laughs> it's easy to do um, and you can find some information but it's not as good as if you were able to get a random sample where people are you have a population and you get this this random selection where everyone in this group is has an equal likelihood of being contacted for the study um you get enough people and this is becomes a legitimate size an adequate population size and so the sample is part of this population What's kind of interesting is if you're looking at, say, average wealth or something, um, if it's a true random sample, it means that the, the, the median, the middle, the average is basically going to be pretty close to the population average for statistical reasons that go beyond this class. But basically know that if, as long as you're doing random sampling, you can have a pretty good idea that your sample is going to, you know, be close to the population. So the control condition, as I said, you know, in you know some research, the control group is the one that generally does not receive any um, any changes. So if you're looking at you know whether fertilizer is going to work or not, you know this in one condition, the experimental group they get the fertilizer, the other they didn't, um, and you see what happens basically. And so we'll talk about that much more when you get into experiments. Natural experiment. This is basically where you look at something in the natural world, like say um, school performance, educational performance, and then you kind of develop it, your study in the way that it's kind of like an experiment where you do have maybe these two different conditions. Um, people who are in the after school program, those who aren't, you know, see if that makes a difference. And then you, you sort of have a natural experiment uh, set up right there. And, you know, you just got to manipulate a few conditions uh, here and there, and you come close to a true experimental design. And I should say, you know, the, the problem experiments are fantastic because they can open, um, open our eyes to different to, to um, different things, you have control, but they happen in labs, and sometimes labs don't always match um, the, the, the world outside. My blood pressure is always higher <laughs> when I'm in a doctor's office than when I'm at home or uh, almost anywhere else, I guess. Uh, anyway, so experiments, they can, you can do some great things with them. You also have to think about when you're doing research, are they reliable? Meaning, are the results consistent? And, you know, could someone else do the research and, you know, probably come up with those same uh, results? Validity. Now, do they, does, do the, do the results satisfy the objectives, whatever they might be? Um, <coughs> excuse me. You know, if you're doing a study of educational performance um, and it turns out that you're looking at people in after school programs, one condition people are the students are seniors and the other they're freshmen, that's not going to be very reliable in terms of after school programs and helping uh, and so on. So validity, do they satisfy the objectives of the study? Do they, um, are they sort of internally valid? Meaning do they, um, do, are they essentially born out? Because essentially there's measurement validity is, is, is pretty important. Um, IQ tests, for example, are these the true measures of intelligence? Um, we find that often they are, and uh, 
we'll be talking about some of these um, some of these in, in more detail as we move forward. What we do find in a lot of statistical research is that most people tend, most scores, I should say, tend to uh, regress to the mean, whatever that might be, and whatever it is that you're looking at. And that's why oftentimes in sociology, what, why it's important for us especially is we tend to work in this area of the average. We're sociologists. We study groups of people and social institutions and uh, things like that. This doesn't mean we ignore, you know, the outliers. Sometimes the outliers might be the most interesting. Um, sometimes they can open our eyes to other things that we may not have paid attention to. Um, but our focus oftentimes is what is, you know, what is the general average? Not always, but but often. Uh, statistical significance. This is just basically recognizing that only by chance could we have gotten this result. That you know that there's a less than five percent chance that we would have uh, gotten the, gotten these results by chance. That means that this uh, statistical analysis it worked. We'll be talking about statistics and quantitative analysis, but just some of the basic terminology so we're not going to get into like um you know you working out statistical problems or using uh spss or stata or, or, or sas or something like this but we will kind of prepare you for it if, if you tend to uh, move in that direction what we also are doing will be talking about basic and applied research so if you were to say go to the University of California Berkeley or UCLA or UCSB um, and you're doing research there and you're just doing it for sociological journals or social science journals you're not doing it for the city or the state um, or to influence government or or, or, or company private policies then what you're doing is what we call basic research so basic science then is is just doing research for the purpose of research. You're not trying to influence government policy or anything like that. Applied science obviously um, is is different. They are taking you're taking the you know what we've learned in from basic science research and then and then trying to apply it to some social uh, or environmental or whatever technological uh, problem. <clears throat> so applied research then is then you know taking that okay how do we use this sociological research and then try to change behavior um, and we can do this through what's called an intervention changing individual social behavior uh, and so on and so forth so again you know that's sort of at the heart of a lot of what we're doing here so essentially what you're going to be learning here is essentially how to do basic research because applied research, in order to do applied research, you first still need to learn how to do the basics. Okay, now replication. This is something that's also very important. Over the last 30 years, and definitely throughout my academic career, the focus has been on, you know, if you're a researcher, you know, do your own, you know, come up with some new research question, problem, uh, thing that's never been done, nobody else has looked at. And so, which is all great and you know that needs to be done but what hasn't been done as much is replication and that basically means re reproducing the results of a study that's been published um, you know either with the data that the researcher used um, or maybe applying their research design to uh, some new setting say they looked at you know sticking with the same one, uh, educational performance and after school programs, and they did it in uh, New York City and Philadelphia, and you want to look at it in Los Angeles and San Diego. Um, <clears throat> that would be another form of replication because you're still, you know, essentially replicating their approach just, you know, in a, in a different place. This isn't as big a problem in, in sociology as it is in the medical sciences because you still have that same logic of you want to do something unique and you know you're going to get a lot of press maybe a new york times article will be written about your research that kind of thing 
Why it's problematic, though, is because in the medical science, especially, we need replication. We need to make sure that that study was done well, that, you know, that the FDA isn't going to act on just this one study, but on, you know, some some replicated uh, research because it can help tell, well, maybe that first study was, you know, they just got the numbers off or maybe the sampling was wrong or something like this. Also, we'll be talking about ethics. If you're using people or interviewing anything like that, they have to, you have to submit your research proposal to this institutional review board uh, that every research university has, and then they uh, then they determine whether it's ethical or not. We'll talk more about that later. Informed consent: If you're interviewing people or you know, if they're in an experiment, they have to uh, you know consent have consent to 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 the research. Now, that doesn't mean you're just totally honest if you're doing, say, experimental research. Um, the experiments, for example, that I'll kind of highlight in this class later on, they involve something called deception research, where you basically, you know, you tell them that you're doing a research study on memory when you're actually looking at uh, race and <laughs> uh, prejudice or something like that, something totally different. So yeah, you are being kind of a Decepticon, decepting, uh, being uh, somewhat deceitful. And as long as it's, as long as you tell them what, you know, the reality at the end of the study and, you know, have safeguards in place that they're not going to be like, and traumatized and damaged by this, then it's okay. Then it's then it's considered ethical. So essentially, as I said, uh, this course will culminate in this research proposal that you'll develop, and it'll kind of kind of go along these lines. Um, and you know, you don't need to develop all of this. You'll see the outlines for those uh, on Gaucho Space later. But this is where we're heading, and. The goal is to, you know, have you complete a research proposal that you could use in a uh, in another methods class um, for a senior honors thesis. Maybe it could be like the spark that ignites your master's thesis and Nobel Prize winning dissertation or something. Anyway, so on on. Wednesday. On Wednesday, I, I'm sorry, I got that wrong. Yes, on Wednesday, I will uh, post another video. Um, you will have your sections with on Zoom, so uh, just to so watch for, for, for those, for the, the Zoom links uh, coming from from the TAs. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to email me. My uh, my name and email are, are, are on the syllabus. Um, I look forward to hopefully meeting you all on the 19th in person. If not, uh, we'll have a Zoom thing going on some days and not on other days, but we'll wait and kind of see what happens. So, all right, everyone, have a good week, and um, you'll see my face on video on Wednesday.